transitioning for, from our non-salmon producers panel, we come back again to talk more about land-based salmon with um, our next presentation with Jonathan Zohar. Jonathan Zohar is a professor and chair of marine biotechnology at University of Maryland. In his presentation, Jonathan will share with us the results from the, from the recirculating aquaculture salmon network, otherwise known as RAS-N, and this consortium's next steps into SAS-2, otherwise called the Sustainable Aquaculture Systems Supporting Atlantic Salmon. Jonathan, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you very much, Jean, for the uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to, it has been extremely interesting so far. I'm going to share uh, my screen. So what I'm going to do uh, the next, uh, whatever, 30, 20 minutes is uh, to share with you um, the uh, work of uh, two federally funded programs, consortia, uh, Grass N, as Jean said it, uh, Recirculating Aquaculture Salmon Network funded by NOAA National Sea Grant, which led to the Sustainable Aquaculture System Supporting Atlantic Salmon funded by USDA NIFA. And both programs have a common, the common goal of working together for the future of land-based salmon aquaculture. Uh, the context, and most of you know this better than me, and over 90% or about 90% of salmon consumed in the U.S. for about 500,000 tons come from overseas at a value of about $3.2 billion, which represents about 20% of the seafood uh, trade deficit in the United States. Um, as a result, we have been uh, witnessing, and uh, many of the producers are here, several billion dollar investment in land-based Atlantic salmon production in the US, either invested or in the pipeline. Uh, we think that COVID accelerated interest in local, secure land-based production, and here are some of the states in which uh, there are uh, currently land-based production of Atlantic salmon or planned uh, operation. Um, uh, this is a slide that I received from Scratting a couple of years ago, and uh, although it's outdated, it's quite amazing to see the projected land-based salmon production uh, in the United States to the right, uh, whereas uh, by 2028, and I know we're a few years late, and there was well, pandemic-related delays and so on, uh, over 300,000 tons by 2028 in land-based salmon production, and to the left around the world, so US, Europe, Asia, Middle East, so it's uh, a steep projected uh, increase. So in that context, the overall mission of the more theoretical RAS-N that then uh, led to the sustainable aquaculture system, the SAS square, is building capacity for land-based RAS production of Atlantic salmon in the United States. And I'm saying it and stating it, uh, the, the mantra of the program is to be stakeholder industry driven. So we are listening to industry, industry are partners in our uh, two consortia and we are responding uh, to the needs of industry. Uh, RAS-N that started, started more as a theoretical program uh, and, and or consortium. Uh, and to the right, you see some uh, pictures from our facility here downstairs from all times where I'm sitting right now, was to establish um, a national, public, private, holistic, and collaborative hub of knowledge. Uh, we wanted to identify, the goal was to identify gaps in knowledge and barriers to success of land-based Atlantic salmon industry and prioritize accordingly R&D. And then based on all of this, to provide a consensus concept paper that will uh, help policymaker, federal agencies, uh, and industry prioritize and effectively allocate resources to promote salmon ras aquaculture in the United States. How did we do this? The delivering of the objectives. So we had annual workshops. Some in, in all the, the three partnering, uh, we have more than just three, but uh, we had um, the lead partnering. Uh, we had meetings in Wisconsin, Maryland, Maine. Some of them went uh, obviously virtual because of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, last week we had, we spent two and a half days uh, with uh, about over 100 uh, of us in Orono, Maine. 
uh, again, annual workshop this, with many industry representatives discussing uh, the, the project, the goals, the next steps, and so on. Uh, we have special sessions dedicated to our consortia at conferences like WAS, RASTEC, uh, Aquaculture America. Uh, we have stakeholder panels and roundtable like this one uh, was in San Diego, February, the World Aquatic Society meeting San Diego uh, uh, in February this year. Uh, we have different working groups that work on different themes related to the industry. Uh, we do industry surveys that you can uh, fill on your, uh, we collect, uh, again, stakeholder and industry input. And we have that concept paper, concept paper that I just uh, um, mentioned a minute ago. The concept, paper, the concept paper, which was a major deliverable of Russ N, is already on our website. You see the website is salmononland.org, and uh, there is a lot of good information over there. Uh, the concept papers had 28 contributors, 15 organization uh, and companies helped put it together. It, it is uh, 20 pages covering state of industry and production practices. And it also includes what we have as a group, as a consortium identify, uh, identified as needs, barriers, challenges, and potential solutions. And this concept paper, this work that I just described, made it relatively simple for us to put together a proposal to uh, USDA responding to the sustainable, aqua, sustainable agricultural system, RFP. And indeed, we always looked at RAS and as a seed to spin off future projects. And indeed, we put this proposal in and at August 2021, uh, we were informed that we were funded $10 million from USDA NIFA for five year, years funding for implementing RAS N. Uh, so we are like more or less ending the first year of work. And this is why we had the first in-person meeting uh, in, in, in Orono, Maine. And uh, SAS Square was then established as a national public private federal partnership that has all these partners. So research universities, University of Maine, uh, different components of the University of Maryland, uh, UMBC, I met our institute, obviously, which is part of the University of Maine, uh, of Maryland, <laughs> Morgan State University in Maryland, Virginia Tech is involved, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, we have government nonprofit partners like the USDA, ARS, uh, National Cold Water Marine Aquaculture uh, Center in Franklin, Maine, uh, we have the Conservation Fund, Freshwater Institute, and we have an international partner in Iceland, Marine Freshwater Research Institute, uh, that is in, uh, in Iceland, as I said. Industry partners are listed here, many of them, I think, are on, the, uh, on this uh, uh, virtual summit. And all of them were there uh, uh, last week in Maine, uh, some of the producer, but other companies such as, you know, feed companies uh, and uh, health management companies and so on. And we have some industry supporters that are not really uh, partners. And uh, uh, SAS Square has 17 specific objectives, and I'll touch on them very briefly. Six research, five education, six extension, there are 32 co-project directors. This is how USDA refers to them, co, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, co-PIs, uh, uh, co, uh, co-principal investigators, co-project directors, 12 par partnering institutions, uh, as I said, one international, nine industry collaborators, of which one benchmark is uh, international. And uh, this project is very much as opposed to the RAS and hands-on, transdisciplinary, you'll see in a minute. We believe innovative systems approach, integrative and translational. It goes from the very basic to the very applied. And these are all the qualifiers that USDA wanted to see in, 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 in the consortium, in the program. So very quickly, uh, those are the RAS and driven SAS square objectives. Domestic year-round egg production. Uh, we know that all the eggs, salmon eggs, Atlantic salmon eggs are coming from overseas right now. So uh, the, the idea is to develop uh, egg production year-round basis based on uh, from uh, North American strains. And we are developing non-invasive predictors of broodstock quality. 
uh, reproductive sterility. We use gene silencing, non-GMO, to eliminate early maturation. I'll touch on this in a minute. Uh, off flavor, we heard a lot about the off flavor. We're looking at the understanding sources. Uh, we are doing met we are using metagenomics and we are characterizing the microbiomes and mitigation. Uh, we're looking at RAS feeds. Uh, for that, we're also looking at uh, gut microbiome and we op optimize formulations. I just wanted to give you the sense that we are using cutting edge technologies of modern biology, but everything is very translational and down to earth. Increase water reuse, waste bioremediation, conversion, uh, microbiology, metagenomics will be used here, economy, market analysis, education. It was discussed in, in, in a couple of the sessions here. K through 12, undergraduate and graduate, RAS certificates, workforce development was mentioned, very important, as well as extension, community engagement, public awareness. And, and so on. I'll refer to it also very briefly. I'm now going to run very quickly through some of um, uh, th those uh, objectives or what we do. Uh, off flavor was very, uh, we heard very important for some species, and not for uh, others. Uh, and I'll uh, say something about it in a minute, but we are going, the understanding is going after the, the producers. We're using, again, metagenomics to identify uh, those microbes that can produce geosmine. And we look at them at the different components of the, the biofilters, the biofilms, and so on. And now that you do it, and this is a collaboration with the Freshwater Institute, we can quantify or we can map the different microorganisms. And here the actinobacteria here in orange, uh, uh, most of the uh, geosmin producing microbes are within this group. And here is a very simple experiment that was done at the Freshwater Institute before UV. Uh, and then after UV, so UV reduces, but it doesn't eliminate those uh, all flavor producers. But then after UV, you aerate, you, you uh, add oxygen, and, and, and they totally rebound. So UV is not good enough, uh, but you, you can do it for different type of mitigation platforms and so on uh, for, to eliminate uh, the, the geosmin producers. Uh, and here is again, underneath from where I'm sitting, it's like in our basement uh, here in the building, uh, we're doing mitigation, uh, we're testing different platforms uh, to mitigate all flavor. The, in this case, uh, it's the uh, Exiton Clean that is using the EAOP, the, uh, so it's the Ex Exiton Advanced Oxidation uh, Process, and this is their, um, their platform, and here are the tanks with the fish, and so we are doing a lot of work with that. That is just one uh, result of many in freshwater with no fish, without fish, although we have a lot of experiments with fish already. And uh, so this is water spiked with geosmin. The blue line here, uh, you can see uh, the control. Uh, it's about, uh, about 80 nanogram per liter remains. And then different combinations of the EAOP, uh, the exit on EOP, uh, with uh, uh, ozonation, ozone alone is doing also quite a, a bit of work, uh, peroxide and so on, all those different. So we're looking at the different combination that will uh, eliminate rather quickly uh, the, the off flavor uh, from uh, the system. This is a very important slide that came or a result that came from the uh, publication of a uh, very recent publication of John Davidson and his group. Uh, and the bottom line, if you look to the right, is that your uh, purge water or depuration water in blue here, uh, and this is the, the, make, the makeup water is in orange, this is the purge water, has waste products in it. So actually there is a spike in, in a TSS, uh, uh, total suspended solids, uh, very early on, goes down, but still stays high. But mainly total ammonia nitrogen uh, uh, remains very high, and uh, which really a reflection that the salmon is utilizing, it, it, it's not fed, but it's utilizing its own somatic tissue, proteins, and so on, and there is ammonia uh, secreted. So the, uh, the most important uh, message here that if you're going to use, the producers are going to use your purging water uh, back into your uh, RAS production tanks, uh, it's best to introduce this water 
to know it, number one, and uh, best to introduce it before uh, the drum filter and before uh, the biofilter. And if you have, if you're going to discharge this water, you should also, this has important uh, implication. Um, oops, sorry. I, I jumped too, uh, too fast. I'm also going to uh, suggest that you listen to the on-demand video that John Davidson is going to, uh, that, that is part of this summit where uh, he, he has, in my opinion, extremely good news uh, for salmon and purging, whereas he's looking at the effect of continuing to feed the fish, market-sized fish, during the depuration process. So uh, that's all in his presentation. I will also say uh, that, um, take this opportunity to say that, I mean, there was a discussion about, uh, there was a discussion about salt water, uh, uh, about different species and so on. And, and so we did a lot of work on uh, salmon now, but on fish species like the gilted sea bream, the sea bass and some other uh, mar warm water marine uh, species uh, that, that are in, raised in salt water. And we never, so in high temperature, like 26 degrees or so on, in, in saline water of 15 ppt and above, we never had, like Joe said, you know, uh, for the pompano, we never had any, any off flavor issues. But when it comes down to low uh, temperature, colder water, either fresh or salt, uh, obviously uh, this becomes a problem. Uh, jumping into producing uh, sterile Atlantic salmon, obviously the idea here is to avoid early maturation and some, there is some other approaches uh, and we are working, we have been working very hard on, on, on a technology to do that, that involves immersing of the eggs uh, in uh, a compound, it's non-GMO. It's a compound that very temporarily silenced the production of a protein that is responsible for the early development of the gonads that uh, ovaries and testes of the migration or the development of the primordial germ cells that really happens in the, at the first few hours uh, after fertilization. So it's, it's at the, the embryo stage. And so here you can see that some of the results, uh, a male with developing testes, those are nine to 10 year or a month old fish, female has a developing ovary and the, the infertile gonad has nothing because non, it has no uh, stem cells of the gonads, no primordial germ cells. And uh, uh, obviously this is all uh, confirmed by histology. And you ask me why it's not out there. We are now at 75% max sterility, similar growth. So right now we are the current uh, trials. We are uh, uh, in, uh, trying to optimize condition for 100% sterility. And once it's going to work, it makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, you do it uh, as I said, you immerse the eggs, and and many uh, in many of the large scale hatchery you use robotics. Here you can see the different buckets or containers. Each containers have eggs from one uh, uh, individual female, and here's a syringe that goes uh, and a, a robotic arm that goes and deliver the sperm. So at the same time, with the same kind of robotics, we can add another arm that is going to add the compound that we are using. Uh, for uh, to induce sterility, and you can do it at fertilization. The immersion would be for 24 to 48 hours. Uh, at fertilization, there is water uptake, so uh, the compounds are going to be uptaken by the uh, more efficiently. But on the other hand, the egg is hardening, and now we are actually working more at pre-fertilization immersion for 24 to 48 hours. The the micropile of the egg where the sperm goes in is, is open. The chorion, the egg envelope is very permeable. It's much better uptake, lower doses. So you immerse uh, for 20 to 48 hours, you wash, and then you fertilize. And uh, those of you who are interested, it's a morpholino technology and we use a molecular transporter that uh, uh, helps the uh, uptake of the compounds from the water into the egg. So hopefully, give us a couple of years, hopefully we'll be there out for uh, commercial use.
We also work on uh, alternative uh, uh, and RAS feeds. This is one example for the work of Alan Place uh, here at uh, IMET in collaboration with Scratting. Uh, for instance, no fish meal diet that has only insect warm meal in it, and uh, which is uh, the, the, the gray bars here. You see it, it, it isn't performing as well as the Scratting commercial diet, but on the other hand, this our uh, no fish meal diet is really far from being, you know, really optimized. Uh, we are working on domestic year on egg production. Nothing new about it. Okay, benchmark, stuffing score, know how to produce eggs year on basis. I've been doing it years ago in Maine and so on and for other species. So we, this is again our brood stock arriving from uh, a Brian Peterson group from uh, USDA ARS Franklin. Uh, so we are working on a marine strain, San John, a uh, strain that performs better in marine system. And University of Wisconsin uh, is working at uh, Stevens Point uh, on a freshwater strain, Gatsby strain. And we are also developing, um, and we're also developing non-invasive like mucus, uh, you, you, uh, mucus wall based metabolic, metabolomic, transcriptomic based predictors so we can tell very easily broodstock and egg quality. And those are the groups that are involved in it. And this is again, our tanks downstairs where the uh, fish are being exposed to phase shifted environmental conditions. So they spawn on a year round basis. Now talking about what has been discussed a lot so far in this summit, um, the, the, the organic waste, solid waste produced by rust. So if you do the calculation here in the blue uh, square here, uh, so about 20 to 25%, the rule of thumb of the feed load, the feed offered, uh, uh, ends up as a solid waste, as sludge, uh, sorry, as a solid waste. This is dry to dry, 20 to 25%. Now, if uh, you convert it to sludge, uh, and again, here are the calculation, but the bottom line is that 100 ton salmon farm produces about 20 ton sludge at 4% at daily. And I'm not sure, Tom, you said the number, I can't remember what it was, maybe you said 25 tons, but I don't know for you know what period, but 100 ton salmon farm, if you do the calculation, more or less produce a generate 20 ton of sludge, 4% daily. What do you do with that? And this was uh, discussed a lot. So our approach was to convert salmon solid waste to fuel grade methane, biogas, and we start by enriching the methanogens that are naturally there. So this is like uh, sludge from salmon tank and uh, the waste include, uh, has in it some methanogen that we are enriching and so on. And at that point, I will say that aquaculture organic waste is totally different from that of other crops, poultry or, or you know, whatever, uh, cattle or anything. Uh, number one, because it's many times it's, saline and we discussed it and it is very high in nitrogen very high so it will kill your anaerobic digester that is being used for chickens or for kettle or for pigs or for anything else so you have to keep that in mind uh, we are 30 days after you see that some of the slug doing nothing uh it's the, the solution clarifies a little bit because of the methanogens that are there. And then we are enriching it by transferring and transferring and uh, enriching it. And then we are doing methanogenic, again, uh, metagenomic analysis to know what are the microbes that are there that we want to enrich. And we are en enriching accordingly by the feedback that we receive from the uh, metagenomic analysis. I, this is a complicated slide, but we end up with a consortium, a, a microbial consortium of, of five different microorganisms that are going to do the anaerobic digestion. So it's not as simple. And once we have uh, this enriched uh, consortium, we scale it up. It's uh, from 20, uh, uh, 200 milliliter in a fermenter that we have upstairs here in the building of 250 liter. Here's the fermenter. And then once it's fermented and mass produced, we collect it into this, uh, we centrifuge it, collect it into this 20 liter canister, and then we uh, inoculate it. So here you see in our facility downstairs here, we are inoculating it into a sludge 
holding tank, the, 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 the enriched consortia, and then it goes, in, in this case, in our tanks, it's a small 100 liter, one cubic meter uh, anaerobic digester. And then right off the fixed tank, you generate energy, you generate combustible biofuel. And uh, here you get you can get so right off the fish tank you can either burn it like as you can see to the left or you can start a methane driven generator and uh, produce electricity. And there was like some discussion earlier on. Uh, this is again right off the fish tank. Some of the bottom lines here. So we had we developed this technology and this mi microbial consortia for either freshwater or saline system, cold or warm water, and those are different consortia for all these different conditions. So we tailor them, okay? It's custom made, and we can obtain up to ninety percent reduction in organic waste depending on feed type mainly, uh, but and other conditions, but. Uh, the last point, energy recovery, our calculation, and I'm happy to go with you over the calculation, are uh, that you are going to, by doing that, and the initial idea to obviously to be friendly to the environment, to have no solid waste, but you also are recovering about 8 to 10% of your energy OPEX, 8 to 10%, and that's quite significant. So we went ahead and in collaboration with Turner Engineering in, in Norway, this was scaled up in Cermak, in a Cermak small production operation in Northern Norway, one, uh, 1,200 tons of small, and we built a 100 uh, cubic, uh, uh, 100 cubic meter bioreactor, sludge to biogas again. And I'm just standing there to, sh standing there to show you the, the scale, again, 100 cubic meter of a bioreactor. And what they do uh, in Cermak, they use uh, the bio, because they're very north in Norway, they use the biogas to operate uh, methane driven uh, boilers and to heat their water. And then they have a flare because sometimes they produce too much methane and, and uh, they have significant offset of their energy cost. Again, our calculation is eight to 10%. Now jumping, shifting gears all together to some of a couple of our uh, other objective. So we are involved in, uh, uh, as I said earlier, in uh, economic or economical analysis of the economy of the Rust system. And Scott Nocky, uh, Caitlin Ritchie, and their team at Morgan State University, some others, Matt Parker, are involved. They are economists in developing different models. Don't ask me questions. I don't know much about those stochastic models and so on. But I think the bottom line, and we heard it uh, from Carl earlier today, I mean, there is, a, and we all know it, there is an economy of scale here, and you need a premium price to make sure that you are profitable, at least in Atlantic Salmon. And then now uh, moving on to non-technical objectives, Russ and, and Sasquare have been involved in many extension uh, efforts. So we have a very nice website uh, for outreach and information sharing. Uh, again, the website is here, salmononland.org, and uh, uh, there is a lot of views uh, of this website, and I, I think it, and then we keep updating it. We added videos, we are, we are doing a lot of things on the website, and we have several other extension outreach and education efforts, which are uh, conducted uh, at, by the three lead universities, University of Maine, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, and University of Maryland. And here are a couple of examples. Communication and outreach uh, is a very important activity with targeted audiences. So community engagement, we all know, and you know, I'm sitting here in Baltimore, Maryland, we all know the, the, the latest example, but every uh, new operation is the same. Uh, I think for uh, uh, Kingfish, uh, Kingfish Maine, it was maybe, uh, uh, a more favorable situation, but in many cases it is not, and in Maryland it was not. Uh, so engaging with the community and uh, trying to reduce the level of um, opposition that is based on not being educated, you know, about what this is all about and how environmentally responsible it is. Uh, so that's an important part of our mission, facilitating, facilitating technology transfer and program integration with stakeholders. 
uh, some of these technologies, as I said, we listen to the stakeholders, to the industry. We are developing technologies like what I discovered, uh, described to you about uh, uh, reproductive sterility, uh, like uh, the anaerobic digestion and so on. But universities are known to not be easy in terms of tech transfer. And that's the whole promise of our program to be able to transfer to industry. So we are looking at that and trying to make it happen e uh, in an easier way. And then we are very involved in education and training. So K to gray, I don't know if somebody used that K to gray. I think in my case, it's K to white needs to know, needs to be. Uh, uh, so uh, certificate, micro-credential, internships, and workforce development. Again, this was discussed during the panel discussion, workforce development, talented workforce is uh, going to be a challenge. And uh, so we are all uh, in our consortium are very involved in programs leading to uh, workforce for this industry. This is the Institute of Marine and Environmental Technology, uh, downtown Baltimore, where I'm uh, now sitting and talking to you from, you're all invited to come and visit and uh, please join the effort. Uh, this is uh, uh, my email and, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and I also wanna thank our audience so far for the great questions that you've submitted. Um, before we go straight into the audience questions here, you presented quite a lot of um, research areas and research interests um, that SAS2 and RASN are working on. Are there any in particular that you're most excited about? Um, so those of you who know my background, uh, my mainstream research over the years have been um, reproductive biology. So all this area of uh, uh, both broodstock management, but mainly the sterility. I think the two, or I don't know, in my opinion, one of the two major challenges for the industry right now is early maturation. It's still a problem. So reproductive sterility, I'm very excited because it's an innovative approach that once, once, once it is going to work, I think it's going to be the one that uh, is going to be the most efficient and useful for the industry. And then I'm also very excited about all the work that we do on the anaerobic digestion, because it's another, it's, it's a big, uh, it's a big challenge. Not that it is the one of the two major ones. I think the two major ones are uh, early maturation and no flavor in, for salmon. So the no flavor is exciting. So I didn't answer your question really. Well, also um, you touched on it in your presentation quickly. And it was also something that I wanted to ask Carl earlier, but we wouldn't have time, but um, the topic of building a qualified local workforce and sort of what available programs or initiatives are there available through SAS2 that can provide some education about recirculating technology and land-based technology. So University of Maine uh, Aquaculture Research Institute has several programs, again, starting from H4, like youth program, uh, because we we start early, University of Maryland has uh, aquaculture in action, so it's a high school program, but there is a lot of internship opportunity, hands-on opportunities, and there are uh, programs for professionals, like uh, it's like the, the um, RAS course that is you know given by uh, uh, the, the Freshwater Institute, Conservation Fund, and so on. So there is a lot of these opportunities at the three universities as well for like um, more, you know, for professional development. Um, this question is from the standpoint of you as a senior advisor for Aquacon. Um, this, this person's asking, can you speak about the intake permit process and timeline for the Federalsburg facility to break ground? Um, so it's stalling. The Aquacon actually is part of our consortium. Uh, there are issues. That's where I. This is what I referred to. Uh, um, to opposition, you know, by the by the community, a very strong opposition. Everything that you do on the Chesapeake Bay is very sensitive. But if you are also now in the proximity of the last. Uh, Creek in Maryland uh, or river that is an active spawning ground for Atlantic sturgeon, it becomes more uh, uh, more of a uh, more sensitive. So I don't know where the process 
stands right now. Uh, and I don't know, I cannot give you a timeline on it. I, I just know that it's, it's again, a very strong uh, community opposition. Uh, this is what we're trying to engage in. Make the community understand that those facilities are not going to harm the environment. Um, this next question is quite a big question, so um, we'll, we'll give it a shot. Um, what is the general break-even tonnage point for salmon ras farms that are currently operational? I, I, I won't have this question. I mean, some of the economists that are involved in our <laughs> consortium, whom I mentioned, may give you the, 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 uh, this answer. Carl, I mean, I uh, can give you, I, I always thought that the rule of thumb was that the break even is about 2,500 tons. You start to make some benefits at 5,000 tons. But those things, as Carl said in his presentation, are changing daily on, based on so many parameters. Uh, Jonathan, how do you deal with high energy requirements for RAS? So one way to deal with it, uh, I think RAS, again, people ask me a lot, why is RAS happening only now? All of a sudden, this big boom, where were we five years ago? And I said, I mean, five year, years ago, it was not technologically mature. And I think now it is. And part of it is energy, uh, better energy uh, utilization, more efficient pumps. Again, I'm not engineer, but this was discussed, you know, in the engineering panel and so on. And the other way is, uh, which I'm I, I, I'm proud of, is uh, the uh, you're converting your uh, waste into biofuel, and uh, you reduce some of your, of your energy costs. But again, you know. This is a question that the engineers can answer much better than I. Um, this person writes, I'm particularly interested in the sterilization work being done. In Michigan, we stock slake, which is a brook trout and lake trout hybrid, and have created some highly popular recreational fisheries. Some have expressed concerns regarding potential back crossing with the brook trout and the lake trout. Any thoughts on how the sterilization techniques being used for Atlantic salmon may translate to other salmonid species? Uh, it will be like almost 100% to salmonid species, transferable and applicable, no problem at all. And I didn't say it because this is a RAS meeting, but obviously the, the goals of the uh, reproductive sterility in our context is to eliminate early maturation. But in the net pen industry or such recreational industry, you want to avoid any possibilities of crossbreeding, which is a huge problem of fish that are being escapees from net pens, or in this case, you know, the question, fish that are being released to the natural lake or whatever, it, it, will, it, it is like, we, we, I mentioned salmon, I, I didn't have time, but we do a lot of work on trout at the same time as we do it on salmon. Well, we're coming up to our time here, Jonathan. Um, we'll, um, it's a, if for those who have more questions for Jonathan, we'll kind of share his email on the chat and we'll repeat his uh, slide that he, um, of the email slide that he shared. Um, but we'll, but thank you, Jonathan, for your time. We appreciate it. And thank you for answering all of our questions here today. Thank you very much.